Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. School districts were given freedom to design their own responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in New Hampshire, so there's something of a patchwork around the state of in-person, hybrid, and remote learning. As this first stretch of the school year wraps up, we're checking in with Education Commissioner Frank Edelblue for his perspective on what's working and what's not. Commissioner, thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning, happy to be here, Adam. Let's start off with President-elect Joe Biden. He says he wants to set a goal of reopening schools, getting back to in-person instruction within 100 days of taking office. Do you support on him on that, or do you think this needs to happen much more quickly? Well, so we know that uh, our school environments that we've created are very safe for children and teachers alike, um, whether it's here in New Hampshire or really across the nation and around the world. Uh, the science really backs up the fact that there is very little transmission of COVID-19 that takes place in these structured learning environments. And really that's a testament to the work that our school systems are doing and the mitigating protocols that we have put in place uh, to allow students um, to get back into instruction. Now we know that across New Hampshire, uh, we've got a variety of different learning and instructional models that are taking place. And quite frankly, it's a fluid and dynamic environment as the circumstances on the ground change in the different communities. One of the resources that was stood up by Health and Human Services is a school dashboard uh, that folks can go to, and it's online at the Health and Human Services website, and they can see really real time uh, the status of learning around the state, whether that is in-person instruction, you know, whether that is uh, you know hybrid, or whether it's a fully remote model. Uh, one of the things that I think is important, and I, and I just I have a lot of admiration for many of our administrators who are working so hard to try and preserve and, and find opportunities to get those students to that in-person learning instruction model. Uh, and so they're, they're doing a fantastic job with that. Um, but we also know that across the state, you know, pandemic learning is not working in all cases. It's kind of interesting. We had a, a recent article out um, from Virginia and then we saw some data in New Hampshire as well that students' grades were suffering uh, during this remote instructional period. Um, and I think what you're finding and what you're seeing really is that, you know, it's been difficult to engage students. Um, and we know this when students are not engaged in their learning, uh, whether that's in person or it happens virtually, that it's difficult to get the learning that we want to see happen to ta actually take place. Um, but I think we have to look broadly when we consider that. It's really not just about the virtual learning that is taking place. I mean, pre-pandemic, we have, we know that you know, online instruction and virtual instruction can work effectively. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of students that learn virtually around the world, whether that's Khan Academy, um, our own VLACs here in New Hampshire, which serves uh, over 12,000 students, or we also have SNU in the state serving close to 60,000 students, I think. But really the issue that I think is important for us to consider is really the social isolation that is happening for many of these students. You know, it's difficult. We've got a, we, we had pre-pandemic an in-person learning model. Uh, that was our instructional and our pedagogical approach. Um, what we did is we pivoted that to a virtual world, but not all of the same techniques that work in in-person instruction work in that virtual world. And so people have had to be really resourceful. Um, and so what happens is in that resourcefulness, they're really trying to find opportunities to avoid the social isolation that we're seeing for many of our students. You'll see parents who are forming what they refer to as learning pods. So very limited cohorts of families who understand, uh, you know, kind of the, the mitigating factors of the families that they're getting with and allowing their students to study together and to be able to really um, achieve that socialization while simultaneously engaging that virtual learning. And it seems that we're having some success with that. But we just have to continue to work to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks in this process. Yeah, and Commissioner, of course, uh, it, you noted this, these pods. Not every student has that opportunity. Is there a, a sense yet in some of the larger school districts how many students are falling through the cracks who don't have the technology or parents are working and they can't be there to help them with remote learning? Yeah, we, we don't, I don't have the specific numbers at the state level, but I do know in each district uh, that the districts are working very hard to make sure that they're connecting with as many students as they can. Um, it is true that sometimes it's difficult to make those connections. Uh, one of the things that we did at the department is we put a million dollars of funding to organizations that generally are connecting already to those vulnerable populations, 
you know, whether it's Bring It in Manchester, the United Way, uh, the Youth Council, actually one of the fun contracts that we had was with St. Anselm. Um, and they were actually sending college students out to connect with these students. We refer to them as porch visits. Uh, so they would actually connect with the students, make sure that they were able to get online, that they understood how the technology worked, work with the parents, help the parents to understand how they can support those, uh, those students. And then as well, one of the other really creative things that we've seen happen across the state is with our child care providers, as well as some, you know, enterprising organizations that have set up remote learning, at, you know, um, centers so that parents who have to go to work, right, they don't have the option of staying home to be, if they need to provide for their families. And so these uh, learning centers have started across the state. Uh, that parents can drop their kids off there and from that learning center they're able to connect to and engage in some of that remote and that virtual instruction. And Commissioner, I know a lot of this is with HHS, but do you have a sense of how the vaccine rollout is going to work for teachers? I know first responders will be going to fixed site locations. Is there a sense that maybe the state will be able to get into schools to give teachers shots? Um, I don't know if they decided that they'll be going into schools. That would be a decision that Health and Human Services would make. I do know that we do know that we've provided um, on our last public health call with our school leaders uh, kind of the rollout plan for vaccine in terms of where our educators fall in that line. Um, and I know that everybody's anxious for that rollout to take place. Let's shift gears a little bit here. You won a long and drawn out battle that seems like it's been going on for months now over federal public funding for charter schools. $40 million finally accepted by the legislature. Where is this money going to go first? Yeah, so just to be clear, I don't know that I won the battle. I would say that the students and the families and the educators here in New Hampshire won that battle. Um, and we're happy that uh, we were finally able to move forward with that $46 million grant for charter schools. Really, Adam, what you want to think of that as is an investment in educational innovation. And if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's the importance of innovating and being nimble in our education system. And so we're hopeful that that funding, um, as it is deployed over the next five and 10 years, uh, will help New Hampshire to retain its leadership position as a leader in education innovation really across the country. Now, I know opponents of school choice uh, contend that this is going to result in increased property taxes on the local level. In a past life, you were a state rep at the state house. It's not hard to imagine you having said things like, you know, you take that Washington money, a lot of times it ends up spending more money in the end. What's your take on that? So we did a complete analysis on that, Adam, and it's available on the department's website. So folks can go and take a look at that. And what we really did is we took and a look at the totality of the, uh, the cost and the burden uh, to taxpayers of this federal grant. And what we actually discovered is that there's a significant savings to New Hampshire property tax holders uh, in an order of 60 million to 170 some million over a 10 year period. So we really think that this is an opportunity both for our students, our families, our educators, as well as our taxpayers here in New Hampshire. Uh, getting back to a little bit of process, where do you stand on the snow day debate? Now that everyone can do school essentially from home, do you think it's still valuable for kids to have a snow day as we did this last week for some uh, who are on remote learning? Yeah, so I am a, an advocate of snow and playing in snow, but I would tell you it's not an either or uh, kind of a decision that you either have a snow day or you don't have a snow and, and you have learning or, you, or vice versa. In fact, we have two very... Um, you know, creative educators who could, were able to continue and have continuity of instruction with a snow day, and they incorporated snow into their instructions. So it is possible for students to get out, enjoy the snow, and be learning at the same time. And I think that that's a great opportunity. And it just shows really the flexibility and the nimbleness of our educators to try and adapt to the circumstances that they have and find ways that students can enjoy the snow and also be learning at the same time. Those don't have to be mutually exclusive. There's been a lot of work uh, for everyone in state government during this pandemic. Of course, uh, your term as education commissioner coming up soon. Do you want to seek another term here if the governor wants you to continue to serve or is it time to move on to something else, you think? So I serve at the pleasure of the governor and we'll see what direction that goes in. Do you feel you've achieved the goals you set out to achieve, though, when you were first appointed to this? Position. Uh, we have made significant progress, and you have to understand, Adam, that I was building on a very strong foundation. Uh, school leaders that have come before me, 
really pioneered innovation in education, and that was present here in New Hampshire. I think one of the, the controversial lines, and I, don't ever, I never really understood why, is I referred to myself as the implementation guy uh, when I first took this role, because New Hampshire had already implemented a lot of really strong policies and objectives for the education system. And my job was really to begin and the work and, and continue the work of shepherding those along towards that same goal. And I think that we've made significant progress towards that. All right, Commissioner Frank Adelblue, thank you so much for your time. Happy holidays and stay safe out there. Happy holidays to you as well. Thank you so much.